As the world grapples with immense challenges, global warming, terrorism, poverty, among others, our guest tonight says mayors and cities in particular are better positioned to address these challenges. So joining us now for more on this view from New York, New York is Benjamin Barber, senior research scholar at the Graduate Center at City University, New York, and the author of If Mayors Ruled the World. Hello to you, sir. Welcome to the agenda in the summer. Hi there. So the subtitle of your book, Dr. Barber, is Dysfunctional Nations, Rising Cities. We'll talk about both parts of that. Let's start with the, the front end of that, the dysfunctional nations. In terms of global governance, why are, what specifically do you think nation states are failing at? Well, that's an easy question because pretty much everything. <laughs> you know, the harder question is what are they actually doing, if anything? And, you know, whether you look at uh, the crisis in Ukraine, which is an old-fashioned 19th century nationalist crisis, whether you look at global warming, where for uh, really 20 years since the Kyoto Protocol, they've done nothing to advance uh, the combating of global change. If you look at illegal, undocumented immigration all over the world and how little states have done to deal with that, if you look at the flight of capital and commodities uh, all over the world and the inability of states to regulate their own economies, if you look at pandemic diseases, you name it, and states aren't doing it. So uh, what we're seeing is not so much just a particular dysfunction of states uh, in 2014, but we're looking at, I think, the historic obsolescence of political institutions organized around sovereignty, independence and national jurisdiction in a world of interdependent global challenges that they're simply not constituted to meet. Okay, so things like the United Nations and the European Union, where they're based on nation states being members, I mean, are, are they relevant anymore? Well, again, you're right, the same thing, because they are founded on sovereign nation states, because in the United Nations, the powerful large nations have a veto in the Security Council. We've seen that the UN has been irrelevant to security, and because the General Assembly is a kind of talk shop of squabbling smaller nation states that can't agree on much of anything, the only place you have some progress made is in the Secretary General's office and the special agencies, but without the real hands-on support of sovereign nations, that doesn't work very well. Even in Europe, which is an extraordinary and noble experiment in pooled sovereignty, mm. which uh, was established because Jean Monnet and others at the end of World War II recognized that the nation state was a recipe for ongoing nationalist wars and slaughter and tried to pool sovereignty. Even Europe, that experiment is reaching, it seems, its limits, both in terms of its ability to reach out to other nations beyond the European Union, but even to hold together peoples within Europe. Europe has become more uh, an experiment in euro currency uh, than in the European, more an experiment in fiscal and corporate policy uh, than in democracy. And the result is, I think we're going to see uh, in the uh, elections upcoming, we're going to see uh, a, a powerful uh, anger and resentment uh, towards Europe on the part of nationalist and right populist parties in Europe. So in general, the United Nations, uh, the Bretton Woods economic institutions, the European Union are all uh, experiments that still are rooted in sovereignty and don't really uh, let those entities grapple with the global interdependent character of the problems we face. Nation states, as you write in your book, you know, and as you just said, are really territorial. They don't want to cede any sovereignty to, to their fellow nation state or their you know, enemy nation state. So what makes you think, uh, Benjamin, that they would want to cede sovereignty to cities? Well, they won't want to cede sovereignty to cities, but the fact is they have little choice to recognize that the growing and important role uh, that cities and metro regions are playing and even be a little bit quietly grateful that cities are beginning to address the questions that they don't address very well. My book is not an argument that nation states are going away or they're going to disappear or that the idea of sovereignty and the subsidiarity of uh, states, uh, of cities and metro regions is going to change. 
What is going to change is the practical impact in meeting global challenges that cities are having. And states already, to some degree, are recognizing that because, thank God, somebody's dealing with global warming. Thank God somebody's dealing with undocumented immigration. Thank God somebody's uh, dealing with issues of big port cities and transportation and trade uh, that the nations aren't doing. So it's not a matter of uh, the states ceding sovereignty to cities so much as it is cities simply doing in the absence of what states are doing by default, doing the things that need to be done uh, to deal with the global challenges we face. Okay, we're going to move on to talk about the, the, that part of your book about rising cities in just a sec, but I want to ask you one more question, and it has to do with, with culture and identity, because no matter where you are in the world, a lot of our identity is, is shaped by our national identity. In, in, in spite of what you say that nation states are, are failing, I mean, people still cling uh, closely to national identity. Do you see that ever eroding? There's no question that what I call the invented identities of the 15th and 16th century, and make no mistake, national identity, the French nation, the German nation, the Italian nation, the English nation, were actually inventions of the 15th, 16th, and 17th century after a period of medieval empire and local uh, city-states and provinces and so on. Uh, England was an invention, as the War of the Roses suggests in Shakespeare, uh, of uh, a lot of duchies coming together. France was invented by Joan of Arc. So those kind of nationalist identities that do provide a kind of solidarity across a wide territory are invented, and the fact is uh, they don't really do what they're supposed to do because national identities not only provide solidarity within a nation, but they also provide the basis for exclusion, separation, isolation, and war. We're seeing it again in Ukraine, where suddenly these old 19th century identities, people are saying it's the Soviet Union reborn. It's not. It's 19th century nationalist Russia and the nationalist Crimea and the nationalist Eastern and Western Ukraine reorganizing around those old obsolescent identities to make war on one another. So yes, that kind of solidarity is still there, but frankly, it's an obstacle to the kind of cosmopolitan cooperation we need as as a human species to survive. Our reality is global and national identities, though they're comforting and give us a sense that we belong to this kind of invented ethnicity, this invented nation, actually stand in the way of solving the problems we have to solve if we're going to have a sustainable civilization. Okay. Your book is about mayors. Um, I don't want to get into it with you, but you are probably well aware that in our city we've, we've had a lot of talk in the past year or so about mayoralty and the office of mayor. Make the case, not about our city, but about cities in general, why mayors should rule the world. I will make that case, but let me start with your city. Because what people always say to me is, oh, you think cities are so great, what about Detroit? What about Toronto and its crack smoking mayor? And my answer is, and I'll come to Detroit in a minute, that Toronto, despite the rather defective mayor who's in power right now, A, he had higher numbers, popularity numbers, than uh, President Obama in the United States. Now, that might be a sad commentary on President Obama, uh, but nonetheless, uh, that's the fact. And the fact is, Toronto remains at the municipal level, thanks to city council, thanks to civic organizations, thanks to the economy, it remains a relatively well-governed political entity. So even even where you have corrupt or inept uh, uh, leadership, as often happens in cities, as it happens anywhere else, cities are better organized to address the real problems of the time. And the fact is Toronto remains a relatively well-governed city that weathered a tough winter and has weathered the economic crisis pretty well as these things go. And then if you look at well-led cities, cities like Bristol in England with George Ferguson or Boris Johnson in London or uh, Emmanuel in, 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 in Chicago or Garcetti in Los Angeles or the mayor of Vancouver, who's a terrific and effective uh, mayor there in Canada, Calgary, you find that in fact mayors, when they are capable, and when they are good mayors, as they often are, are capable of solving problems and doing things that nation states simply can't do. And here's why. Let me just lay out very briefly what that argument is. The central argument is that cities are the quintessential human communities. They're where we're born, 
where we grow up, where we're educated, where we get married, where we pray and play and work, where we get old and where we die. They, they really define us. You mentioned earlier that somehow our national identities define us, but most people I talk to will talk about the city where they're born, the city where they're living, the city where they work, the city where the kids got married, their, the city where their uh, father or mother died. The city really defines us, and it is the root community and political organization that does the things government's supposed to do. Health, education, crime control, transportation, jobs, all those things that make life possible and create a framework within which we can pursue the things we care about, our careers, our religion, our creativity, our families, that's where government, that's where rubber, the rubber hits the road in government. And that's why, by the way, you'll never see a city closing its doors. Twice uh, in the last two years, uh, your great neighbor to the south, the United States of America, closed its governmental doors. You literally closed the United States. And what was extraordinary is, first of all, nobody noticed. Uh, but second, and more importantly, uh, it really didn't impact people, whereas there's never been a time in history where any city, not Toronto, not New York, not Albany, not, uh, not, not Calgary, not Banff, no city, large or small, can close its doors because cities are where the rubber hits the road. Cities are where real government happens and where mayors have the job of making it happen. And no mayor can ever stand up and say, I stand on principle and I'm closing the city, despite Rob Ford in Toronto. The last thing for Toronto was to say, oh, we're going to close for a while until we get a better mayor. Mm. Uh, you got to make things happen. So cities are where real governance happens. Mayors know it. And that turns mayors into pragmatists and problem solvers. And perhaps the most important difference between mayors and prime ministers, between mayors and presidents, between city councilors and cabinet members of a national government is that in cities, you've got to solve real problems. Pick up the garbage, plow the snow, keep kids coming to school, make sure there are enough jobs for folks. If they're illegal uh, and undocumented workers, figure out how you're gonna deal with them because you can't throw them out, they're there dealing with real problems and finding real solutions. And that makes mayors pragmatists and problem solvers and allows them to deal with the real issues of governance that people in national government, the prime ministers and presidents, simply don't have to and don't do. Okay, at a pragmatic level, bring into real concerns, things like global warming or terrorism. How does that film into the context of cities dealing with those issues? Well, that's a really good question. A lot of people say to me, well, sure, it's easy if you're talking about uh, uh, plowing the snow or keeping the schools open or maybe an emergency room in a hospital, but how do you deal with these big, how are cities supposed to deal with these big global issues like global warming or terrorism or perhaps undocumented immigration, which is a global problem, uh, when even nation states can't do it? And again, here's the difference. Uh, cities are the place, first of all, that create 80% of gross domestic product all through the world. Cities also produce 80% roughly of greenhouse gases and carbon emissions, which means cities both produce but are the place you can deal with carbon emissions, even if states don't. And the reality is that cities one by one, by greening up their ports, by insulating their buildings, by providing hybrid public transportation, by providing better subways and rapid transit systems, by getting people out of cars, by introducing bicycles, cities are proving that they can actually impact real carbon emissions at the same time that states are explaining why their sovereignty prevents them from doing so. At the same time, uh, cities, because they also work together in intercity associations like ICLE, the C40 climate cities, uh, energy cities Europe, these inner city organizations are allowing cities to begin to cooperate together on common measures. Energy cities Europe and the covenant of mayors in Europe pledged that cities would exceed the standards of emissions set by the European Commission, and they have done so. They've done better than the states to which they belong, and they've done better than the European uh, Commission. So cities one by one but particularly cities working together can have a real impact on a global problem like warming that is manifested primarily in cities. You know, you, we talk about cities as sort of this monolith. They come in all shapes and sizes and different jurisdictions and different amounts of powers that, that each one of them have. So how can they collectively sort of take a gr greater leadership role given those barriers? 
Well, that's a really important question, and, and you're right on the money there. There's no question that, you know, there are cities from 50,000 and 100,000 and 500,000 that go up to 5 million. And then we have cities like Chongqing in China that has 35 million. You know, these are these immense mega cities or Lagos, Brazilville in, 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 in Africa or uh, Rio, uh, Sao Paulo, Mexico City that have 20 million, 25 million people. And there are vast differences among them. So there are differences in size. We have port cities and inland cities, although keep in mind 90% of cities are on water, and that means they're especially vulnerable to global warming. We have strong mayor and weak mayor cities, uh, where the mayor plays a very important role or a weaker role. We have cities run by city managers and some run by mayors. We have cities like in England and France that are chosen, where the mayors are chosen indirectly, and cities like North America where they're uh, elected directly. So you, there are vast, vast differences in cities, and we have to take those into account. But here's what's remarkable. The fact is, whether you have a city of 100,000, a million, or 10 million, there are certain fundamental affinities and identities that all urban conglomerations have, large or small, governed directly or indirectly. They have density of population. They have a smaller carbon footprint than the surrounding exurban uh, and rural areas. Uh, they have creativity and entrepreneurship. They have, above all, diversity and multiculturalism. You mentioned earlier nations, a virtue and a vice of nations is that they are monocultural. One culture, one language, one ethnicity. Cities, small and large alike, are diverse, multicultural, and therefore they need tolerance, they need acceptance. Uh, from the beginning of time, small and large cities alike is where people who saw themselves as different whether it's nowadays gay and transgendered, whether it was in the old days, people who felt uh, politically out of place or even women who felt unaccepted in rural countryside, they go to cities. People have always gone to cities for possibility, for social mobility, uh, for upward movement, for entrepreneurship, for creativity. And all cities share those qualities regardless of size, regardless of how they're governed, regardless of whether the mayor is chosen directly or indirectly. Those qualities call it urbanity, call it cosmopolitanism, call it creative diversity, call it entrepreneurship. Those qualities are what make cities attractive, what make them magnets today, what has led to the fact that a couple of years ago, the UN announced that more than half of the world's population live in cities in the Western world, in Canada, the US, Europe, and Japan, it's actually closer to 80%. That's why people come to the city and all cities regardless of the differences you enumerated, have those qualities. Okay, I appreciate that, that what you're saying there is what cities have over non-cities is acceptance because there's so much diversity of, of life and services and all those things. But one thing that cities do not have, at least to present time, are armies and peacekeepers and the people that have to come in and deal with or, or at least uphold some kind of peace or get some peace when there is conflict. How would you address this problem if cities had more power? Well, let me give you a slightly cynical answer and then maybe a, a more direct answer. The cynical answer is, oh my God, cities don't have armies. What a disaster. They can't <laughs> slaughter each other. They can't kill each other. Oh dear, let's get them some atom bombs real quick. So they can, <laughs> I mean, some would say it's a virtue, not a vice. And I would put it a little differently. I would say that National, national entities, nations, nation states have territorial borders and they are engaged in a territorial non-zero sum game with one another. And they need armies and air forces and navies to protect their borders, to protect their territory. When Germany gets bigger, Poland and Belgium get smaller. Uh, but cities are different. When Warsaw gets flourishing, Berlin can flourish too. Cities can all flourish together. They're not in a zero-sum game. A, a, a city with a better opera company doesn't preclude another city with a better opera company. <clears throat> Cities are not involved in these zero-sum games. So in that sense, uh, they are interactional, they are interdependent, they are transactional, they, are, they play together at a global level much better than states do. And there's a reason they don't have armies and navies, because frankly, uh, they don't 
really need them because they work around cooperation, not armed competition as the basis for, for what they do. But here's the second thing, because of course we live in a world where there is violence and there's terrorism and so on. Uh, the second thing is that even in these areas of security, cities are playing an increasingly important role. I tell the story in my book of New York City after 9-11, when then Mayor Giuliani sent 12 or 13 detectives from the New York intelligence squad and by the way, in the new era of terrorism, intelligence is the key weapon, not an Air Force or a Navy, knowing what the other side is doing. He sent his intelligence squad to Washington to join Homeland Security. And they spent about 18 months in Washington through 2002. And they came home at the end of that time and they reported by then uh, Mayor Bloomberg had been elected and Ray Kelly was his police chief. And they reported, look, we've been in Washington for nearly two years. And frankly, there's no intelligence in Washington. I think they meant that both ways, mm. <laughs> but there's no security intelligence. We're not learning anything. The FBI doesn't talk to the CIA. The CIA doesn't talk to Interpol. Nobody talks to us. We're not learning anything about the terrorist threats to New York from being in Washington. And Ray Kelly had the really smart idea. He said, why don't we redeploy our intelligence squad city to city? Send one detective to Frankfurt, one to Rio, one to Jakarta, one to Hong Kong, one to London. Let's send them to the world capitals, one to Moscow, where people learn about terrorism, where the other police officials know what's going on. Well, I would suggest that one of the reasons New York has stayed relatively safe since 2001, despite the fact it remains the number one target for terrorists everywhere, is because we are doing city to city intelligence sharing. Hmm. And just the little other side of that story is Boston didn't do that. Boston continued to rely on the FBI. Well, it turns out the FBI had learned from the Moscow police that the two marathon bombers last year had intelligence reports in Russia, in Moscow, that said they were dangerous. And that report was given to the FBI. The FBI did not give the report to the Boston police. Had they given that report to the Boston police, the Boston police would have known that the two guys, the perpetrators, uh, were known terrorist suspects and might well have arrested them before that happened. If Boston had had a direct connection with the Moscow police, they might have learned that. So this makes a difference. So even in an area that we think of as the crucial national security area, cities, which are the real targets of terrorism, are learning that by cooperating directly with one another, they can actually have a powerful influence on preempting terrorism. Okay. Let, I, I just want to speak for, uh, for a minute or two about how this might Please. all unfold. In your book, you make uh, the argument that you could have a parliament of mayors. In terms of government, government, governance, how would that work? Well, it's interesting you mention that because I, I'm a political philosopher and a democratic theorist, and although I've worked with Bill Clinton and I've worked with a number of presidents and I've been a consultant in foreign governments, you know, I wanted this book to be a practical book, not just to kind of talk in theory mm. about how cities are important. So I did suggest in the final chapter that maybe there was a place now to think about constructing a new global body, a global parliament of mayors, bottom up, opt-in, not, not a body that gave orders, not a world government that tried to tell states what to do, that wasn't going to work, but a body that allowed mayors to meet globally, share best practices, think about common regulations and common things they might do, not by top-down regulation, but by bottom-up opting in, cities saying we'll opt into that, that would change the way we responded to our global problems. And to my surprise, in the six or seven months since the book has been published, I have found dozens and dozens of mayors who have said to me, this is a good idea, we want to help you develop that. And in fact, we've held a meeting in Seoul, Korea, with Park Won Soon hosting and a meeting at City Lab in New York that the Bloomberg Philanthropies sponsored last fall, uh, doing some thinking about it. And next September, on the 19th of September in Amsterdam, the so-called G4 mayors of Holland, that's the mayor of Rotterdam, Amsterdam, The Hague, and Utrecht, are hosting a formal meeting, a planning session for a global mayor's parliament uh, to which we already have 30 or 35 mayors from around the world who have said we want to be part of that process. We want to come and consider what it might mean to create such an organization. So the idea of a global mayor's parliament is not to replace the UN or replace uh, the interaction of sovereign nations, but to add 
kind of a keystone to the arch of intercity associations that allows mayors and cities to work together, to share practices, to talk about common uh, regulations, to talk about the ways in which when they work together, representing over half the world's population, 80% of the population in the developed world, they can make a difference in dealing with these global issues we've talked about that states simply aren't dealing with. So the Global Mayor's Parliament is a first real, pragmatic, and practical step to bring the wisdom and pragmatism of city officials and of cities to bear on the world's global problems that we're not dealing with. Okay, before I let you go for tonight, let me ask you that. Given that you just said we're at the starting gates of this, that, that it's taking some practical shape at least, do you envision a, a, a real day though where the balance between the powers of cities versus the nation state really happens? Well, there's, there's two issues there. One is what I'm talking about is already happening. The earlier, my subtitle is uh, Dysfunctional Nations, uh, uh, Rising Cities. But my old uh, subtitle was uh, If Mayors Rule the World, Why They Should and How They Already Do. The shift in balance is happening. It's not happening because I called for it. I recognize something already underway. There is a real shift all around the world to the importance of cities, the importance of city governments. In Italy, Matteo Renzi, the new prime minister, formerly uh, the mayor of uh, Florence has called for a reorganization of Italy around metro regions to be represented in the Senate there. So this is already happening. And then the second point simply is we have to have someone dealing with these problems or we're going under. If we want a sustainable planet, if we want a just planet, if we want a planet without war, if we want a planet that deals with all of the illegal immigration that goes on, we need a body that can begin to deal with it. States aren't. A global parliament of mayors would. Those are two good reasons why we can feel optimistic about the future. Benjamin Barber, fantastic conversation tonight. Thank you. We're going to continue it tomorrow. We'll see you then. Thanks. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.